Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Although the response was a little bit weak, but it's okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, He has favored us with so many favors. We praise Him upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. May Allah bless them, bless every one of us and grant us goodness. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, moments ago, someone read a few verses of the Quran standing exactly where I am standing right now. Do you remember his name? If you do, say it loudly. Adam, mashallah, Adam. It's also the name of the first of our species. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Do you remember the first surah that he read? Again, please. Al-Fatiha. How many of you do not know Surah Al-Fatiha off by heart? Please put up your hand high. If you don't know Surah Al-Fatiha, you don't know... That surah that you read at the beginning of uh, Salah, you don't know that surah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, right up to the end. If you don't know that, put up your hand very high. Okay, one brother, mashallah. A sister, mashallah. Another sister, Alhamdulillah. Okay, I want to tell you, it's the opening surah of the Quran. It's a beautiful chapter of the Quran. But I want to let you know something. The bulk of us, as we progress in Islam, one of the first things we learn is Surah Al-Fatiha. We learn it in the Arabic language. And you know what? If he were to have made a mistake in that recitation, we would have all picked it up, right? Right? The little boy sitting in the second row. You know Surah Al-Fatiha off by heart, right? Can you get up and read it for us, just where you are? Mashallah. Did you guys, some of you at least, hear what he read? It was, it was a beautiful recitation, mashallah. It was actually quite correctly pronounced as well. Notice how, notice how, it's not only the words that matter, but the exact pronunciation of the words as well as the connection of those words. When the words are connected, there are certain sounds that should be coming out of your mouth that he acknowledged and actually fulfilled. Okay, why am I doing this? I want to tell you something. If we were to go to China today, or to Japan, or you name the country, where would you like to go? Far away. Say? Pakistan, Bali, mashallah. All right, I see some people are in holiday mode. Yeah, mashallah. <laughs> so, my brothers and sisters, if you were to enter a mosque there, if you were to meet some Muslims there, right? And you were to read or, or at least join them in prayer, and they were to read Surah Al-Fatiha, which means the opening chapter of the Quran, if they were to make a mistake in it, would you be able to correct them? Can you answer me, please? Would you be able to correct them? Yes. yes. Okay. But do you speak Chinese? No. You see what I'm saying? And I'm going to ask you a very interesting question. How many of you speak Arabic? Put up your hand, please. Very few hands. Very few hands. Perhaps ten, right? Put your hands down. Out of all of us, very few speak Arabic, but everyone can read this surah in the Arabic language. Okay? 
Many of us, most of us would know the meaning of that particular surah or chapter of the Quran, but we don't speak Arabic. And we don't speak Chinese or Indonesian or Japanese. But if we were to go to those countries and someone were to attempt to read Surah Al-Fatiha and they said, for example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamun. What would you say? Alameen. That was wrong, right? It's Alameen. But you cannot communicate with them. You cannot even say, how are you? Can you say, how are you in Chinese? Some of us can, right? Ni hao. Okay. So, but beyond that, not much. And yet you corrected them. You couldn't speak Arabic or Chinese. You corrected them and you knew that they were wrong in Arabic. And if you were to read, they would know you were wrong in Arabic without understanding so much of it. And this will apply throughout the globe with almost 2 billion people. Do you see? That, for me, is one of the biggest miracles of the Qur'an. Subhanallah. That I can have a child, I can have anyone, any race, any nationality, any color, wherever from, any financial standing, any social status, whatever it is. If they were to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and they would know it, the whole globe knows it, they would definitely be able to be corrected by another, even if that other was totally different in any one or more than one of the aspects we just mentioned. It's a miracle. It is Allah. The Almighty says, we have revealed this revelation, this reminder, this book, this Quran. We have revealed it and we will ensure that it is preserved. That's what Allah says. We will ensure it is preserved. So I was asked a question by a revert sister saying, I'm a revert, but I have one question. Why can I not pray in English? Is that not a brilliant question? Very good question. I say, sister, what do you mean by pray? Because supplication is also prayer. And we have something known as Salah, which is a very unique act of worship, which has no English equivalent. So we just call it prayer because that's the closest possible word. But in actual fact, it's an act of worship that starts in a specific way, within a specific condition, facing a specific direction, saying a specific words, ending it in a specific way. And that whole set would be known as Salah. We just call it prayer because it's the easiest term, the closest term. But actually, if you were to speak to a person of another faith and you were to say, let's pray, what would they do? They would supplicate mostly. Supplication in Arabic is called dua. So if I were to tell you, let's make dua, that's what I would say as a Muslim if I was speaking to some other Muslims. Let's make dua. But if I were to translate that into English, what would I say? Let's pray. The same words, right? Let's pray. Can I pray for you, my brother? Please pray for me, okay? That means make dua for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when someone says, why can I not pray in English? That statement is flawed because what do you mean by the term prayer? If you're talking of the general prayer that people of other faiths refer to, in a common way, then you can pray in any language. We believe that even if you're silent and you're praying, meaning dua, making dua, the Almighty knows what you want before you say it. And that's why if you have a Lamborghini in your heart and you're saying, oh Allah, give me a Ferrari, and that Ferrari was just by mistake, the Almighty will still know that you actually don't want the Ferrari, you want the Lamborghini. You follow what I'm saying? Sorry to give you car examples. MashaAllah. Allah bless us all with whatever we wish for. 
So if you were to say a person's name, say you want to marry someone, okay, this is a more realistic example, right? And you don't know their name. You thought their name was Fatima, okay? Say, oh Allah, get me married to Fatima. And yet their name is actually Maryam. Will Allah give you someone else called Fatima or that Maryam? Who? If Allah knows it's better for you, He may even give you the Fatima. Subhanallah. <laughs> How many of us were praying for Maryam? We ended up with Fatima, who actually was better than Maryam, mashallah. With all due respect to those who are named Fatima and Maryam, I'm sure we're all lovely people. Mashallah, I had to cover my back, right? <laughs> Uh, so my brothers and sisters, the Almighty, when we pray to Him, if we make a little blunder in what we are actually uh, asking for in terms of supplication, the Almighty knows it. It's auto-correct. It's done automatically by the will of Allah. And this is why if you were silent because you don't know what exactly to say, you know, the Almighty has registered it already because it's, it's within your mind. It comes out from the heart. Sometimes people say, this man's dua came from his heart, you know. Like when someone's really kind to you, they do really good things. You know, they say the dua came from the heart, which means you've really touched the hearts of people. May Allah bless all of us. But that salah that we have, the term prayer is used. I can explain to you why it has to be in the Arabic language. So we're not talking of supplication. We're talking of the five daily prayers and the units of worship of a specific nature. We call it salah. In Urdu they call it namaz. Right? Is there any other language we have they call it something else? Anything else? I think throughout the globe if you say salah or namaz, one of the two words, the whole world will know what you're talking about, right? Okay? Is there any other language that uh, has a different term referring to salah? Anyone? No, prayer is there, but we're talking of something like, you know, prayer, yeah, it's, you're right. The answer is technically correct. Uh, okay, so that's what we're talking about. Now, if I were to start, when I say Allahu Akbar, that's how I start my prayer. I need to have a good intention that I'm praying and what I'm praying and so on. Uh, all that having been said, I need to be clean. Now, cleanliness means I need to arrive at a level of purity. One day I was speaking to a young boy in the masjid. He said, look, my feet are clean. Why do I need to wash them? And you know, now to talk to the young people, it's quite difficult to explain to them, listen, that's, uh, that, that's it, you know. The true answer is, look, Allah requires you to do it, you have to do it. That's the true answer. But it requires a level of faith to adopt and digest that answer. When the faith is a little bit low, you, that answer is not yet, you know, upon the level that would affect you. You need something a little bit, you know, different. You need a common sense explanation. So I said, look, guy, I want to show you something. I see all these brothers in the masjid. He says, yeah. I said, if we're going to tell them, right guys, we're coming around sniffing feet. Everyone whose feet smelling, you wash them. And if your feet are clean, it's okay, you can be in. So we're going to sniff the feet because we don't want smelly feet here. Said, it's going to be a problem. Imagine going around. You, we, we, we would have developed a little sensor that you have with a long stick put by the feet. Okay, go wash yours. Beep, that's okay. Wash yours. Beep, that's okay. Right? It would be an insult to the people. So the Almighty says, listen, before you come into here, make sure all of you are upon a level of cleanliness, cleanliness that would ensure that you don't embarrass the people standing next to you. That's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, if any one of you has eaten onions, or you know, raw onions, raw garlic, etc., don't go to the prayer area until you've washed your mouth thoroughly. Subhanallah. You know, because imagine you're going to be saying, Amin, and the guys next to you will just be turning their faces and saying, Oh gosh, this guy shouldn't have opened his mouth, man. You know, so you're making it difficult for the people next to you to actually pray, right? And this is why, uh, which smell would you prefer? The smell of raw onions, raw garlic, or the smell of cigarettes? Which one is easier to handle? I mean, a chain smoker. For me, I can tell you, it's easier to handle the raw garlic and raw onion, right? To handle the cigarettes. It's a little bit difficult. So the whole purpose is to make the people who are praying with you be comfortable. They need to be comfortable to pray. No one must think, I'm not going to the mosque. These guys are smelling of, of you know, bad things all the time. I go in there, it's stuffy. Make it such that the environment is comfortable. You will earn a reward when you enter the mosque with a good smell. And everyone. And sometimes the perfume people use smells like mango pickles. 
you know. I swear, I wonder. I think to myself, gosh, we should have dipped our bread in this and eaten it, man. This is not to spray on your, on your body, subhanallah. But that's what happens. So when you're coming into the mosque, what you need to do, make sure. Even if you're coming to a function of this nature, make sure the people sitting next to you are not feeling uncomfortable because of uh, how you smell. So the Prophet ﷺ speaks about it. When we get to that masjid, and I was telling the young boy, everyone should have their feet washed. At least so many or so much time prior to having come in. So if you've maintained what's called wudu or the ablution in the way that you're supposed to maintain it, it's valid. You can walk in and carry on. But if you haven't, you're going to have to wash your hands and your face. You can't say, well, my face is clean. I'm not going to wash it. Or I've got a bit of makeup. I don't need to wash it. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I know Mac is quite expensive, right? But to be very fair and honest with you, your relationship with the Almighty is priceless. Priceless. I can... Well, I was going to say I would wipe off any Mac for the sake of Allah. But you know what? I don't use it. So no, no. Uh, but still, you need to ask yourself, what's more valuable? Yesterday, someone asked me a question. You won't believe it. Can I tell you? I'm attending a wedding. Can I join all my four salahs because uh, that wedding? Because I don't want to. You know, I'll read them in advance. Like, it's not like I'm going to make them kaba, like, you know, It's not like I'm going to delay and read it later. But I want to read it in advance. And I was like, is, are you serious? Are you for real? You know, to be honest with you, it might be your last opportunity to meet, meaning to, to have this communication with Allah and to plug in in what's known as salah. It could be your last, your last opportunity. You know, we've known of people who've died at weddings, you know, where the, the halls come down. I've actually known of it. It's not common. I mean, it's not very common, but it can happen. And not only, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the roof coming in, but... A particular person could die of a heart attack. You could, you know, I could drop dead right now. Imagine if I just compromised my relationship with the Almighty and so on. I'd end up, subhanAllah, in the grave uh, with regret. So we, you have to wash certain parts of your body to arrive at a certain level of cleanliness. And that's a spiritual cleanliness as well as, to a degree, physical cleanliness. Why do I say to a degree? Because there are times when perhaps... Water is not available, there is a different type of cleanliness. I was telling those earlier today at another venue here in Glasgow, I was telling them about how those who struggle with OCD need to know that actually the bacteria and the presence of bacteria does not render you unclean always. What do you mean? You know when you wash and then you wash again and you wash a third time. If you think you're doing it for the sake of Allah, you're actually not. Meaning if, if you're just doing it because of this OCD that you have, right? May Allah grant us all cure. Look, it's something, it's a phase, it happens to people. But why I say this is because, think for a moment, if the water wasn't available, what would you do? There's something known as? Tayammum. Tayammum means to just use dust. Dust to do what? Wash yourself. Okay, so how do I do it? Well, I just tap my hands on it and I do, you know, my hands, my face, etc. And I know for a fact this is dust, there's bacteria here. Allah says, don't worry, you've arrived at a level of cleanliness that, is, that has readied you and prepared you to begin your prayer. Subhanallah, that proves that, you know what, I know for a fact there's bacteria, there's a bit of dirt, there's a bit of this. Allah says, ignore that. It's, it's irrelevant for now because you didn't have the water. It's irrelevant. So if you look at it, Allah just wants you to do what He has told you to do, even though He knows that it might not be absolutely pure, completely to the degree that there's not even 1% of dirt. That's never the case. There has to be. You know, a little bit of it is excused. It's excusable. You cannot be 100% pure in terms of physical purity, cleanliness. There's going to be a little a droplet here, a little splash there, a small thing. Yes, if you can see it with your eyes and you know about it, clean it. And how do you clean it? Do it how Allah told you to do it and you're done. After that, don't worry about it. Move on. Just move on. Do your prayer. It will be accepted. Did you hear what I just said? May Allah grant us ease. I hope those who needed to hear that would actually benefit from it. Right? I tell you, now that we are all uniform and we have got to the, the masjid and we are standing to fulfill the salah, 
Imagine if we were allowed to start our salah and to use, I'm not going to use the term prayer because now you know what I'm talking about. Prayer, according to what I believe, uh, is a terminology that's only used to refer to salah which is not actually translated as prayer in its whole sense. Okay, and I explained that a little bit earlier. So imagine if we were allowed to have that in all our languages. So how would we translate Allahu Akbar? Can someone say it? Someone say it? Allah is the greatest. That's one. And secondly, Allah is greater. That's another one. Akbar. Akbaru means greater. It can refer to the greatest. It can refer. Allah is the greatest. Okay. Allahu Akbar. Okay. Someone might say, well, let's analyze the term Allah as well. You know, why should I say Allah is the greatest? You know, I'd rather say my maker is the greatest. But actually, that's a wrong translation. But I could say, the worshipped one is the greatest because Al-Ma'luhu Hu Allah. You go back to the Arabic language, Allah is the worshipped one. Who is the worshipped one? Whoever made me. So I can say, whoever made me is the worshipped one and the worshipped one is the greatest. We would argue all night about what exactly to say. Solve your problem, just say Allahu Akbar and everything is done. Okay? Secondly, what would happen to the Qur'an? The Qur'an is the word of Allah. Right? That's what we believe. It's the word of Allah. But the English language translation is only man's attempt to explain to you what he believes is the closest to that which Allah meant by his words. That's all. That's the reason why generally when you find a translation Qur'an, it is very strongly encouraged to have the Arabic on one side and the English in order to you know, to act as an indemnity to say, you know what, listen to this. This is the word of Allah. This is just my attempt to explain to you what I believe is the closest explanation for that word of Allah. I could be wrong. Man's translation can be wrong, but the word of Allah is never wrong. This is why today someone was asking me, what's the best translation? And I said, you know what, Sahih International, together with the explanations of the context of the revelation of the verses plus an explanation of those verses that are not easily understood by the people with a little commentary. And that would be much better than just a word for word translation. Just like the Bible. I've read the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And I can tell you something. There is a lot that can be misunderstood from it. If you don't know the context, you don't know how to understand it. You don't know, you know, the deeper knowledge of it. You won't understand it in its totality. The same applies to the Quran. You may not understand it. You will need explanation. Some of those verses, a lot of them you will understand. But mashallah, you want to derive benefit. You are going to need to learn from someone. You're going to need to ask questions. I mean, you will see verses that have a context that is very different from what people are trying to make it seem sometimes. Different context. So my brothers and sisters, if I were to read in a different language, we would argue over the meaning of Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, Lord of the, praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. That's what most would say, right? Someone would say, no, 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 you can't say that. You actually, and then we would start arguing and so on. Instead of getting on with our prayer, we would be debating over what exactly is the meaning, the precise meaning, okay? You know what Allah says? You have to do it in the Arabic language. Number one, we promise that we are going to preserve the book. One of the ways of preserving the book is to make sure that every Muslim on earth, whether they speak Arabic or not, memorizes at least three short chapters that won't take you longer than 24 hours to memorize in order for them to be able to fulfill this prayer the way we want them to fulfill it. So that every Muslim on earth will have contributed towards the preservation of the Quran by knowing a minimum of three chapters of this Quran off by heart without even knowing its meaning at times. But they know the pronunciation. Look at this young boy. Do you speak Arabic? You don't. He read Surah Al-Fatiha. He read it eloquently, clearly. He read it with the rules and regulations, almost all of them. And he doesn't know Arabic. 
Isn't this book preserved? How is it preserved? The non-Arabs are reading it at times better than the Arabs. And you know what? They, they know it. And they don't speak the language. They've contributed towards it. I've had the same sister. I told her, sister, it won't take you long to learn Al-Fatiha. Which are the two favorite surahs of the people who are quite, you know, want to be quick in salah. The minute you say, well, Allah, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Please. Inna a'tayna kal Right? Am I right? Come on, just be honest. I mean, it comes to my mind too. Let's be honest. Come on. Right? Uh, yeah, and what's the and then in the second rakah, Allah What comes to your mind? Qulhu Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakulhu kufu one, and they're already half down. La ilaha illallah. Allah forgive us. You know, may Allah forgive us. And someone says, Wal Asr. Wal Asr is a little bit, you know, tricky because people confuse it with what team. And sometimes, you know. I had a friend called Umar Regan and he says he was shouted at because one day as an imam he made a mistake at the end of the, the surah, you know. Uh, because when you say, Illa amanu wa amilu salihati, this one says, watawasaw. And that one says, falahum. So when he says, watawasaw, someone screamed at the back, falahum. You know, and he was like, oh, I almost got a shock. You know, I don't know if you've seen him explaining that. He's a comedian, so he dramatized it a lot, you know. And I'm like, Ugh, he almost dropped. I said, whoa, I dropped listening to you, man. I wonder how it must have been in real life. My brothers and sisters, it's a miracle. It's a gift of Allah. I don't even want to ask you the question because I know the same hands would actually go up or down. We would know these three surahs or at least three short ones. How long did it take you? The problem with us is we haven't made an effort to learn the meanings. It's not difficult. People ask me, how can I concentrate in prayer? And I tell them, you know what? You just need to concentrate on the meanings of what you're saying. You'll be fine. Concentrate on what you're saying. You know, imagine you, when you're saying Allahu Akbar, you're saying the one who made me, the worshipped one, uh, is the greatest. And then you're starting with your short uh, you know, du'as, little supplications in there, little praise of Allah and some of the surahs. And if you know the meanings of it, it's not difficult. It's not difficult at all. So if I were to ask you and you were to answer, you would realize that every one of you has contributed towards preserving the Qur'an by memorizing at least Surah Al-Fatiha. You see what I mean? And by memorizing another two, three surahs, to say the least, as a minimum. That's a miracle. So, if you look at this, subhanallah, Allah says, we will preserve the Qur'an. So the rules and regulations that he laid automatically preserve the Qur'an. I promise you, if we had to read the Bible prior to the Qur'an, if we had to read the Bible in Aramaic, as it was revealed in the language of the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him. And it was given such importance that every prayer had to be read. And they had a specific salah where they had to read it in the Aramaic. Perhaps, perhaps, who knows, Allah knows best. It might have been preserved in a similar way. But Allah wanted the Quran to remain unquestionable, undoubted. I saw a little video that someone sent me showing how they believe that this Quran has been altered and changed and whatever. And someone told me, will you make a video to respond to it? And I said, I don't need to because the whole world's Muslims know the same Quran. There's no point to try and prove to a person who went out looking for a needle that didn't exist in the haystack. And pretended like they found it. That was part of the hay. It might have been a bit of a sharp piece that pricked you. It's not a needle. Did you get what I just said? It's not a needle. There's nothing wrong. There's no contradictions. Nothing. It's not there. It's just you've not understood it. That's what it is. You haven't known the context of revelation. People say, why in one place of the Quran, Allah says, oh, regarding alcohol, that you know, you, when you're getting to pray, make sure that you're not intoxicated. That's what Allah says in one place. So does that mean we're allowed to drink? Water, yes. <laughs> to be honest... In another place, Allah says, stay far from it. It's the handiwork of the devil. Abomination from the handiwork of the devil, right? So Allah says, stay far from it. If you don't know what's the meaning of 
abrogation and how the Quran was revealed over a long period of time, you would never understand. If to you, it would seem like a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. If you read some of the verses in the Quran without knowing the context, you're going to understand something way beyond what it actually is saying to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. This is why I say it's our duty. Beyond just knowing the Arabic, which was part of preservation and congratulations to everyone, no matter who you are, you know, congratulations to you, knowingly or unknowingly, you have contributed towards the preserving of the book. Subhanallah, you have. And therefore, nobody can debate. I told you and I started off with the question, if you were to travel to a destination of your choice, and they were to read the Quran, you would be able to tell the major blunders that they would be making without knowing that particular language. Isn't that a miracle? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So my duty is to learn a bit more, to make a slightly a bigger effort to learn a bit more. When I was young, alhamdulillah, I memorized the entire Quran. I spoke a bit of Arabic, but it wasn't enough to understand the meanings of the Quran. Just like the Arabs, at times they would read the Qur'an, they wouldn't know the deeper meanings of the Qur'an just because they spoke Arabic, you know. I mean, you go to Egypt, they'll tell you, and you don't even know what they're saying. And they're supposed to be Arabic. I mean, come on, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, right? Am I right? Amazing. Amazing. So, my brothers and sisters, consider yourselves fortunate to have been chosen by Allah to preserve the book. It's a beautiful book. It is the word of Allah. It has in it cure. So much so that there have been experiments performed on individuals who have calmed down simply by listening to the melodious verses of the Quran being recited in a beautiful way. It has in it an effect of calming such that you cannot explain a believer achieves greater calmness, contentment, and inner peace than those who don't believe. But even those who don't believe and the other creatures of the Almighty are impacted by the recitation of the word of Allah. Without a doubt. You can go and check it. Today we have a lot of information online. You can Google it, it's fine, no problem. You check it out and you'll see what I'm saying. Subhanallah. Alladheena amanu wa tatma'innu qulubuhum bi dhikri Allahi ala bi dhikri Allahi tatma'innu qulub. Do you know what that means? Allah says those who believe are the ones who achieve true contentment in their hearts by the remembrance of Allah. For indeed, it is only by the remembrance of Allah that the hearts will achieve contentment. What's the remembrance of Allah? It starts off with the Quran. It's the highest level of remembrance of Allah is the recitation of the Quran. If someone says, I want you to engage in some dhikr and you open the Quran and you know what? You started reading, that would be dhikr. It would be remembrance of Allah. You know, it doesn't mean that you need to uh, do anything else before you start off with the Qur'an. May Allah grant us the understanding. Yes, there are other adhkar that are very important. But the Qur'an is the word of Allah. Nothing compares. Nothing substitutes it. It will calm you down. And you know what? I tell people who are into all sorts of music, I tell them, you know what? Substitute it with the Quran, listen to the various reciters, you'll find a recital that will be soothing to your own nature, to your liking, tailor-made literally to what soothes you. If I were to ask you, who's your favorite reciter? Let me ask you the question. Just say it loudly. Who's your favorite reciter? Let's hear some names. Abdullah Basfar. Who else? Ra'ad al-Kurdi. Who else? Mahir al who else? Ajami, who else? Say it again. Yasir Qadi? Yasir Dawsari, you got me surprised. I was saying, is he a reciter? <laughs> Subhanallah, but yeah, you get, you, you're right. Dawsari, Yasir Dawsari, who else? Fatih. Shatri, Fatih, mashallah, all these names. Now, do you agree that every one of them reads differently? 
you know why we have a favorite reciter? You know, I had a, a, a friend who told me, you know what, uh, you heard what Brother Farooq said at the beginning, we're all here for the sake of Allah. That's correct, I agree. We have to be here for the sake of Allah. Okay. Moments later he said, I want to introduce you to, some, to, to, to the reason why you're here. Did you hear him say that? Isn't there a contradiction? No, there isn't. You're allowed to come for the sake of Allah to listen to your favorite speaker. There's no shirk in there. I heard one scholar say it's shirk. You know why? Because nobody attends these talks. <laughs> I promise you. He says it's shirk to, to, attend, to, to, to attend a specific scholar's talks. You must attend all the talks. Brother, I don't want to attend your talks. You doom me. I feel the heat of Jahannam on my back when you talk. And as for these other guys, when they speak, I feel encouraged. I want to attend. So don't come and lie to me that it's shirk. And I've heard decent scholars say that. And the real reason is because they don't get a good attendance. There's no other reason. If they had a brilliant attendance, they wouldn't say that. I believe that you are allowed to have a favorite Quranic reciter for the sake of Allah because that recitation soothes you. It's not shirk. You know, a shuraim, how beautifully he reads. It's amazing. And if, now we can actually watch. Before we only used to hear the audio. And you watch this man, you know. How many of you were very surprised when you saw for the first time what Sheikh Ali al-Hudhayfi looks like? Right? You're surprised because you've heard him. I heard him since I was a child. When we saw him, I actually met him. When I lived in Medina, I was fortunate enough. Let me not go into all of that. But... I saw him, I said, wow, this is the same voice. Doesn't even look the same, right? But then you get used to it, okay? We're so fortunate. Each one of us has a different temperament. Each one of us has a different, you know, mood. Sometimes, you know, you have Khalil al-Husari, who's a powerful reciter. Really, Shaykh al-Qurra. He's one of the top. He's the Shaykh of all the Qurra. Khalil, his name is Shaykh Mahmoud. Sheikh Mahmoud is his name, Khalil al husari You listen to him, amazing. But some people are not really as moved by that. They can listen to, you know, a more uh, melodious recitation of Sheikh Muhammad, Muhammad Ayyub. Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub, rahmatullahi alayhi. He is sahib al-maqam al-hijazi. He reads in a specific way. And he has this maqam, this tune, you know. We heard the recital. Earlier, a beautiful tune. Some people don't like the tunes. Some people want a loud, you know, straightforward recital. This is part of the miracle of Allah. I, I said earlier, you substitute that with this and see how your life changes. It's not difficult, you know. Those people who are into heavy metal music, if you were to have a recital of someone, you know, Idris Abkar, I think that would wake you up, you know. Who knows Idris Abkar? Listen to his Surah Al-Isra. It will, it will conquer any heart. If you go to YouTube and you, you, you search for Idris Abkar Surah Al-Isra, I think that's one of the most fantastic recitations he has ever rendered. Because you can have the same reciter and at times it's a little bit different based on their voice, based on, based on the, the sound, based on the masjid, based on the environment. You could have the same reciter reading in a different way. Subhanallah. Isn't that a miracle? Miracle of the Quran. Subhanallah. Amazing. So many different recitals. They're reading the same Quran, but it sounds so different. It sounds like, you know, this melody is amazing. If I were to imitate a few and ask you, who am I imitating? You, would you know? You would know. Can we try it? Okay, let's try it. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين. Say your name. Everyone's got it right, right? You want to try someone else? الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. Say your name. Al-Hudayfi. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين سنة علي جابر عبد الله المطرود السملة بتسلوة You got it Okay what about this one الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين Anyone heard that? Anyone heard that before? I, I see only the people in the first soft know who it was. Please can you put up your hand at the back if you know the, that recitation you recognize it. Put up your hands. Rahmatullahi alayhi Shaykh Muhammad al-Subayl He was an imam of Mecca In the haram in Mecca For almost 50 years Subhanallah Amazing right What about Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen No come on An imam in Mecca still called Salih ibn Humayn You agree What about Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين Anyone? أحمد طالب محمد أيوب The point I'm raising is It's the same surah It's the same Quran It's the same words But each one is soothing in its own way, impacting upon everyone in its own unique way. So Allah says, "Alladina amanu wa tatma innu kulubuhum bi dikri Allah, ala bi dikri Allahi tatma innu kulub." It is indeed the remembrance of Allah that will calm the heart of a believer. That's what calms the heart of a believer. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us the calmness. I've only touched on three or four different aspects. Of these miracles in a very unique interactive way. The reason is when we talk about miracles within the Quran, the basics we haven't ever spoken about sometimes, right? And we don't appreciate it. I was saying moments ago, there's nothing wrong in having a favorite reciter for the sake of Allah. If you came here for the sake of Allah to listen to someone who may move you, who will inspire you, there's nothing wrong. Even if it's only a specific person or a group of people or one or two of them, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.